Line A1, learning task one. This is your very first video that you are going to go and see in second year as part of the video-driven curriculum that we are deploying in response to COVID and everything else like that. A um, couple of things I just need you to be aware of before we start into the lesson material. First of all, there's not going to be a lot of scene changes. We're used to our media constantly presenting us with scenes that are changing every couple of seconds at the maximum, which tells us that something new and something exciting is happening. Inside of here, we're going to linger on our slides for quite a while, long time while we explain and go through, which means that if you're always skipping ahead looking for the next scene change, you're going to miss a lot of material, which is fine. That's on you. You're an adult. How you choose to go and watch these videos is going to be entirely up to you. It's going to reflect in your exam marks. And if your exam marks are not where they need to be for the year, that's going to result in you having to go and repeat the year. So I encourage you stay through, watch the videos, you know, take your hand off of the mouse, sit back and just cover through. Use your highlighter and your binders as we're following through. Okay, let's jump into the very first bit. The first bit that we're going to cover is just going to be some basic trig terms. Now, I know it seems that, you know, we're electrical school. Why are we going through all this heavy basis on trigonometry? Because the first four learning tasks are all going to be about that. It's because we use a lot of angular analysis. We are not going to be able to go and understand how to add together all of our different values of voltage and current particularly in third year, if we don't understand how to go and deal with angles, because we're going to go and have angles that are going to represent different timing that stuff is going to be happening. at. So we just need to go and have a real basic foundation. There's a load of stuff on the internet on, you know, how to deal with angles, how to calculate angles, etc. So I'm going to blitz through some of it pretty quickly. We're also going to go and rely upon our calculators very, very heavily. Everybody should be operating off of a sharp EL520. If you're not, you're screwing yourself because I'm going to be showing you how to go and operate with the sharp buttons off of here. And as well, you are going to be given this calculator anytime that you are going to write an ITA, Institute Training Authority, exam, whether for your standard level exams or for your interprovincial exam. So if you decide you want to use your TI-83, great. Have fun with your TI-83. I will not be able to answer any questions about the operation off of it. And when you hit an exam, you're going to have to deal with the additional stress of your calculator being taken away and one that's unfamiliar to you being given to you. So if you don't have one of these, just go get one of them. They're only about, you know, 12 to 15, maybe 20 bucks tops. Uh, they're available at Staples. They're going to be the Sharp EL520 family that you're going to find. Screenshot this. Make sure that the buttons on the one that you're picking up look the same as these ones over here. Case style stuff might differ a little bit. So we're going to be using this one to go and deal with a lot of our angles. We're going to cover over the basis of how angular calculations are done. And I'm going to show you a bunch of shortcuts on this calculator that we are going to use throughout the year, because I don't believe in doing things the long and difficult way. If we have got technology given to us, that's going to make it much easier. In this case, because this technology is going to be given to you for every exam, why not learn how to use it the most efficient way? We'll cover that as we hit these points. All right, the very first thing that they talk about is just definitions of angles. These are all things that you would have learned back in elementary or middle school. First one over here is just going to be a right angle. Anything that's going to have a 90 degree corner, an acute angle, anything that's going to be less than 90 degrees, and an obtuse angle, which is going to be anything that is going to be more than 90 degrees. Complementary and supplementary angles are going to go and be ones that are going to either form a 90 degree corner or a 180 degree straight line. If we take a look at complementary angles, these are the two complementary angles, B and A would consider to be complementary because they add up to become 90 degrees. It could be 45 and 45, like in this case, it could be 30 and 60. As long as the two numbers add up, it's considered complementary. Supplementary angles are going to be anything that adds up to become a straight line. A and B in this case, we see those two adding together. One of these could be 30 degrees, the other one could be 150 degrees, and if you add them together, we end up at 180 degrees, which is going to be the angular displacement of a straight line. We're also going to go and have to cover the fact that similar triangles are possible. We're able to go and have triangles that are going to be different sizes, but they're going to go and contain some stuff that is going to be the same. If I take a look at these three, triangles. I see that the blue angle is going to be the same on all of them. I see that the red angle is going to go and be the same on all of them. And I see that the green angle 
is going to go and be the same on all of these, irrespective of the size. We're going to go and have a bunch of similar triangle usage that we are going to use where we are going to have impedance triangles later on. We'll explain what those are when we get there, as well as power triangles. So you just have to be familiar with the idea that we can have multiple triangles that have got different sizes, but they can have the same angles. A couple other types of triangles we won't really use a lot. Isosceles triangles where I'm going to go and have two sides that are going to be the same. That's what's identified over there. And then equilateral triangles, which are going to be more of a third year thing where we are going to go and have three sides of a triangle that are going to be the exact same sign. One thing with an equilateral triangle is that we are guaranteed that we are going to go and have all three angles that are going to be the same, which is going to go and be 60 degrees on every single corner off of these. The isosceles, the only thing that we are guaranteed is that these two are going to be the same, although what angle particularly varies based upon the steepness of that isosceles. The triangle that we are going to be most familiar with is going to be this one, which is going to be a right angle triangle, where we are going to go and have one line that is truly horizontal, we're going to call that thing the x-axis in a lot of cases, we're going to have one line that's going to be truly vertical, we're going to call that the y-axis, and in between those two we are going to go and have a right angle. Right angles are always going to be identified with a little square inside of the corner. Once we know that we've got a right angle, we've also got a couple of other parts that we can go and name off of that right angle. Particularly, we can go and name the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is always going to go and be the long side of any sort of a triangle. And once we have got a hypotenuse named, we can then use that with Pythagorean theorem. This is once again going to be some basic trig knowledge that you would have had from elementary or middle school. I can't remember which level that they put it in, but somewhere way back there, where you would have gone and calculated the length of the hypotenuse. The most common calculation that you would have seen is this one over here, where we are going to establish a hypotenuse by taking the square root of my a squared plus my b squared. When you're punching this stuff in inside of a calculator, make sure that you are always, always, always putting in sufficient amount of brackets. When in doubt, bracket it out. Those things are free, just use them so that you're not gonna end up with a faulty calculation because although you might have theory down, if you put in the wrong types of uh, brackets off of these, you will end up with wrong numbers off of these. These numbers are going to correspond to our sides. Over here we see that the hypotenuse is labeled as being that C. That's where we're getting this calculation from. And if we know what our values of A and B are, we can then calculate that. Let's give ourselves a couple of values of A and B. They're not uh, true to this one over here necessarily, but we'll call that this one here has got a value of 3. This one over here has got a value of 4. And if we've got that, we can calculate our hypotenuse by using our calculator. The way we would do that is we are going to go and use our square root. So our square root is found underneath the second function, so right above the x2. What I'm going to want to do next is I'm going to want to bracket because I've got a bunch of stuff in there. So I'm going to go bracket. And then if you want to be doubly safe on stuff, you can always add an extra bracket. We're going to go and say our b side. So if we take a look at this, that's going to be 4 over there. So we're going to do 4 squared. That's this button right over here. And then I'm going to go and plus bracket my a side, which is going to be this one over here, 3, 3 squared, bracket, close off my master brackets. And then when I hit enter or answer, it tells me that the answer for that is going to go and be 5. We're going to see this triangle a lot throughout the book. It's going to be our classic 3, 4, 5 triangle. It's a familiar set of calculations you should be familiar with it if you aren't i'm not going to give you worksheets on it because the internet is full of worksheets on pythagoras just go and google in pythagoras worksheets you're going to be able to pull up a bunch from there from this formula we're also able to go and derive two other sub formulas and the two other sub formulas are going to allow me to go and find the missing side of a triangle in other words if i know what my hypotenuse is on a triangle that's c i can do c squared minus whatever the remaining side is that i've got in both of these ones over here, we've got either B squared or A squared. And you'll note that the big difference for these is that we are now using a minus rather than when we were using a plus when we were looking for the hypotenuse. Once again, do a little bit of practice on these ones. It shouldn't take you very long. You know, it's like falling off a bicycle. You never forget how to do it. And then you should be back in shape on this Pythagoras. We'll use it at times. We're also going to go and use some other shortcuts, but this is always going to be one we'll rely 
Angle designations are also gonna be useful. It's useful to be able to say, well, we got an angle, we call it A, but inside of a lot of our triangles, we're gonna go and use a set of Greek letters over here. The most common Greek letter that we are probably going to go and see throughout this year is gonna be this one over here, which is gonna be my Greek letter theta over here. We're also going to go and use another Greek letter, which is gonna go and be phi over here. Uh, sometimes written like this as well, that also counts as phi. This one uh, that they show inside of your binder has got kind of a fancier symbol to it. It's a mathematical symbol, but it's the exact same letter. It's like cursive for Greek. Uh, we're also going to go and use our alpha, which looks something kind of like that, as well as our beta that we are going to go and have. These are all Greek uh, terms that are gonna be familiar. Of them, theta is usually going to be used to go and designate an angle. And we'll use that angle for power factor. We will use that angle for phase angle inside of circuits, all sorts of stuff. And I'll identify that as we get up. But generally speaking, if you see a theta, you're gonna be looking for some sort of an angular component. Last thing that we're gonna go and talk about is just the difference between a vector scalar and a phaser. Anything that is a scalar just possesses quantity. These are gonna be things like area. Area is just a quantity of, you know, cubic millimeters or cubic centimeters or cubic inches. It doesn't tell us, you know, if I say that I have got a container in my hand right now that is a hundred, you know, cc's, hundred cubic centimeters, that doesn't tell you if that thing is square or round or oblong or, you know, like a weird, geometric shape or something like that. It just tells you what the volume itself actually is. Same with temperature. Temperature doesn't tell us a direction. It just tells us this is the total amount of heat that we have in an area, etc. If we have something that has got a magnitude and a direction, we are then going to go and call that a vector. And it's a vector is something that's got a certain amount of force type of behind it, as well as a direction that it's going to be acting in. Gravity is going to be something that has got a vector quantity. You know, it's got a force pulling downward and a direction pulling downward that we're going to go and have off of that. I should actually just start marking these as I go down. Scalars, vectors, and then the last one that we are going to go and have is going to go and be my phasers. Phasers are going to go and have magnitude, direction, and rotation. These are not gonna be something we're gonna use a lot until we get to third year. In third year, we're gonna have an electrical system that is constantly moving across you know, A to B to C. We're gonna freeze it so that we can analyze it, but we're always gonna be dealing with displacements from one to the next. If I were to go and take a look at these and have to short form them, what I would say, scalar, magnitude only, that's all it has. Vector, magnitude, and direction. And if I were going to go and talk about a phaser, it is going to go and have magnitude plus direction plus rotation. It's all that we're looking at for these three. We'll talk about them, you know, we'll explain when we're using scalars, we'll explain when we're using vectors, we'll explain when we're using phasers, but that's what the terminology itself actually means. All right, that's it for video one, which is just a real basic review. We're gonna go and move on into our learning task number two, which is now gonna to start to describe the relationship, all of those SOKOTOA that we learned uh, previously as well.